Hello, we're talking about selective breeding. We're uh, looking at this for the IGCSE specification. And here are just some images about selective breeding, and we'll come on to them in a little bit of time. So, definitions to start off with. What is selective breeding? It is defined as a means of producing animals and plants with desirable characteristics by choosing individuals to breed from and by repeating this process for many generations. In a sense, you could redefine this as being artificial selection. It sits against natural selection. Uh, this is artificial selection because it is mankind, men and women, who would be making these decisions uh, and choosing which individuals breed with which to make the organisms with desirable characteristics. Until about 12,000 years ago, Basically, every human was a hunter-gatherer, uh, like these fine fellows in this picture here. But from about 12,000 years ago, farming began. Now, you might dispute that date, but it was some time ago, probably in that sort of region. And these farmers grew plants and kept animals for uh, food and for milk and meat, and it meant that other activities could go on. You didn't have to spend all your day collecting up your berries and hunting and doing all that sort of stuff. So there's more time for other things and that leads to all sorts of other activities such as painting or art or indeed making laws and coming up with rules and developing hierarchies and politics and people coming together into cities and all sorts of things like that that we rather take for granted now. Being farmers allowed the farmers not only to have a more reliable source of energy, it also meant that they could experiment with the organisms they were rearing. And one of the experiments they would do, we assume, is to take their best performing organisms and breed them with each other. And so trying to get bigger yields from their crops, more meat and milk from their sheep and goats, and that really is the essence of selective breeding. We've now rather refined this process and now we will aim for all sorts of desirable characteristics. For example, we'll decide which cattle to breed to produce cows with, let's take a higher milk yield. Or which wheat plants to breed to produce plants with a higher yield. Or plants that are resistant to fungal diseases. Now this is not a wheat plant, this is a pumpkin plant. This is uh, rather uh, pertinent to me. We grow pumpkins in our garden and they get covered in mildew, the leaves in particular. You can see a, a little close up here of this mildew. Now all this white powdery stuff around here, that is a fungus and, and that fungus destroys the leaves, cuts down productivity and really reduces therefore the amount of photosynthesis that that leaf can do, therefore the amount of glucose that leaf can produce. And to take a more aesthetic example, which dogs to breed to produce a pedigree of a certain type of dog. Well, look at these cute dogs. You may think they're cute or not, but we'll come back to them later. So they choose the individuals, breed them together, and then we've got to go to the offspring. You are looking for the offspring from this cross with the best combination of your desired features and keyword here the most desirable phenotypes you may this remember this word from genetics when we think about Mendel the phenotypes is the physical expression of genes so what something looks like use only these individuals the ones with the best phenotypes for the next generation and then hopefully those ones will pass on their desirable alleles Remember, an allele is, well, let's define it, is a version of a gene. It's a version of a gene. So we want the versions of genes which give us these desirable phenotypes. And we want these alleles to be passed on to the offspring from this cross. Then you test those offspring and you repeat the selection process, generation after generation and after many generations you get very desirable productive animals or plants. How does it work? Well traditional selective breeding works like this in plants. Let's say we have the aim to produce wheat with more grain and with shorter stronger stems. Why do we want shorter stronger stems? Well it reduces waste and increases the yield. How so? The stems 
are not a useful part of the wheat plant for us. They hold the wheat plant up fine, and if they were competing against other plants, then they would want to grow high in order to get to the light. But of course, in a field, all the wheat plants are going to be to a pretty similar height, and so that competition aspect, at least from the farmer's point of view, is irrelevant. Therefore, the farmer would want shorter stems, number one, because there's less waste going into the stem itself, less energy from the plant, and number two, because they're less likely to get blown over in the wind. Shorter stem is a stronger stem. And here's an example of a breeding program going on. This is the, this image is taken from the Canadian Food Authority. Thank you, Canadian Food Authority. You can see here we've got different wheat plants of different stem lengths. And uh, so, you know, these ones tend to be that sort of height. These ones here, maybe more that sort of height. So here we've got a shorter stem from that point of view. That's probably a desirable characteristic. Of course, there are other characteristics you'd be interested in the wheat plant. For example, how much grain there is actually per wheat plant and ultimately how much grain you can produce per hectare of field. I suspect this is some sort of university wheat off. How do you do it? Well, you do it by taking the pollen from the anther of a plant with desirable qualities and transferring that directly to the stigma of another plant with the same desirable qualities. Difficult to show in wheat plants. Wheat is a wind-pollinated plant, so its flowers are smaller. Now, you can do it, of course. Uh, they tend to self-pollinate as well, wheat plants, so it's a slightly trickier business. It's very easy to illustrate with orchids. Orchids are insect-pollinated with big, beautiful flowers. Indeed, that's why they are so desirable. And quite simply, you take a paintbrush, you dig your paintbrush in there, get onto the anthers, and you can see here we've got a whole load of pollen on the tip of that brush there. So that brush is going to the anthers, here we've got the pollen uh, remaining, and then that pollen can simply be brushed onto the stigma of another plant. And therefore you're choosing exactly which plant breeds with which plant. Now ideally you do this in a greenhouse because out in uh, the environment there are lots of pollinators around and therefore you can't really control which plant is fertilized by which pollen because those pollinators will pollinate indiscriminately. Farmers have also selectively bred animals for many many generations. The hope of course is that they will produce more meat, milk or eggs. Uh, for example this Belgian blue here, this is an enormous beast and you can see of course this proud farmer here is bearing his prize bull. Um, now the Belgian blue bull has a myostatin mutation. Myostatin is a gene which stops muscle developing and in you or me we have this gene activated so we don't end up looking totally ripped like this bull here. We've got to work pretty hard if we want this sort of a figure uh, that this bull has. Now of course you probably want a human figure but hey there you go. Now in this bull this myostatin gene has been mutated such that it doesn't work and you then breed from this particular individual and uh, you hope as a farmer it will pass on that allele to its offspring and hopefully that those offspring will also have this mutation and will produce enormous quantities of muscle. Muscle of course equates to meat and therefore it is a very productive animal. Now of course you can then think well what good would this animal do if you then let it loose in the wild? Number one it has an enormous requirement for food. It's going to have to forage better than it's ever foraged before in its life and it just won't find enough food. Secondly of course if a predator comes anywhere near this, it will try and run away and in all likelihood will simply collapse under the stress of running all over heat. Its heart will go, no, this is far too much, I'm huge, don't make me run. And so that will be the end of our myostatin mutation cow. Of course, it's not a cow, it's a bull. Cattle, that's what I should say. You might want to produce an animal with... Uh, more fur or better quality fur or different patternings of fur which is what you get on these Siamese cats here. Siamese cats have the 
Himalayan gene, or the Himalayan, depending on how you want to pronounce it, gene, which causes their pigment to be darker at their extremities. We could go into why that is. Uh, it's really interesting about uh, pigment generating enzymes denaturing at body temperatures. Uh, but let's leave that to one side for the moment. And then there are a whole load of different shades of these pigments that you can then breed for. You might want your animal to produce more offspring uh, or produce offspring or eggs very regularly. Uh, that, of course, is what chickens do. And you'd also probably want your animals to show increased resistance to disease and parasites. These are sea lice on salmon. And if you could breed salmon which were resistant to sea lice, well, that would be extremely helpful if you're a fish farmer. And also, hopefully, it would re reduce the population of sea lice getting out into the open around Norwegian fjords, Scottish fjords, uh, and off the coast of Canada, and all sorts of places like that. Now, there are techniques uh, which often go with selective breeding. You can, of course, if you're selectively breeding animals, just you know, put a male animal in a field with a female animal, and say off you go. Uh, and this is the traditional method. This ram here is what magnificent horns he has, and what a magnificent fleece. Uh, obviously, a very desirable, obviously a very desirable ram from the farmer's point of view. And so he will put this ram in this field, and well, he is doing what sheep do. We'll leave them to it. We shan't interrupt any further. You could use artificial insemination, and we'll come on to that technique in a moment or so. You could do something called embryo transplantation. Let's say you have generated many embryos from very desirable organisms. You could then transplant those embryos directly into the uterus of female animals. <laughs> Obviously female animals. <laughs> what am I saying? And then those female individuals will give birth to desirable embryos. Again, these embryos have been generated from desirable organisms and you can put them into any female of their species and they will grow up and uh, be born that way. Of course you are then not necessarily putting at risk prize female specimens by putting them through a pregnancy. You can use cloning and you can use genetic engineering and those are going to be topics we think about on another occasion. These are not examples of selective breeding but they are techniques which sometimes go hand in hand with selective breeding. So, artificial insemination, as promised. It's been going on since the 1950s, and this is a cracking diagram of what's going on. Well, this chapel chap has here, this is a vet, and clearly they've got an enormous arm length rubber glove on. And they need that rubber glove, because you can see where that rubber glove is going. The rubber glove is going here, up through the anus. Now, if you put a whole load of semen up a cow's anus, it's not going to do a wealth of good. This straw here is full of semen from a very desirable bull and therefore hopefully uh, carries alleles for the desirable traits of that bull and the straw goes up the vagina of the cow. Then this arm goes through here and kind of reaching through the walls of the digestive system and of the reproductive system gets hold here and squeezes the semen out into the reproductive tract of the cow. So two arms, uh, well one arm in the uh, up into the uh, bottom end of the digestive tract and then the straw going into the reproductive system there. So what's the advantage? Well, you can get semen from bulls with many desirable features uh, and then you get that semen and you dilute it and freeze it and you can keep it for a very long time if you freeze it down in liquid nitrogen. You can then buy quantities of the semen, inseminate your cow with it if you are a farmer and one prize bull uh, can inseminate thousands, indeed thousands upon thousands of cows and these prize bulls are very expensive, they are very good earners for the farmer uh, because each little straw of semen can be worth a pretty penny or two. There are problems associated with selective breeding. As a farmer we are selecting for a very select number of alleles. We want alleles which will make an organism larger, will give us a larger yield, 
maybe a shorter stem and we are breeding and breeding and breeding only with those traits in mind therefore all alleles for those traits are going to feature heavily in the offspring but the other thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a lot of inbreeding we're going to be breeding with cousins with cousins uh, if it's plants it's maybe uh, offspring directly with parents or offspring from one generation back into that same generation so there's going to be a lot of inbreeding going on and what this ends up doing is narrowing the gene pool we're narrowing the gene pool so long selective breeding programs mean that you lose some alleles from the population from the wider population limiting your gene pool and therefore you potentially put yourself up for a problem if you reduce your genetic variation too much you make your species prone to being wiped out by a single disease you also have problems such as this this image was actually taken from the Guardian for an article on whether or not selectively breeding pedigree dogs was cruel and there's a fair argument to make here you can have a look particularly around the nose region these bulldogs find it very difficult to breathe their nostrils are basically closed up and they're always having to constantly breathe through their mouths uh, you can also see that their eyes are very droopy and uh, their sight is uh, foreshortened. You have other breeds of dogs with massive problems with their hips until recently Siamese cats the, many many of them had a kink in their tail and those are only on the visible physical characteristics of course there are digestive tract problems very often associated with pedigree animals as well and all this is because of inbreeding and focusing on a very small number of alleles considered by us to be desirable therefore reducing the size of the gene pool. Here are some tutorial questions. Uh, I suggest you pause on these questions, maybe jot them down somewhere, and you could even go back and re-watch the video to see what answers you come up with. Thank you.